Some big developments on Thursday with Chelsea owner Roman Abramovich, one of several Russians sanctioned by the UK government, joined by ESPNFC senior football writer James Olley. Let's start, James, by putting this in layman's terms. What does this mean and what could this mean? Well, in terms of the day-to-day running of the club, Chelsea can still operate as a Premier League side, but the talks over the sale of the club um, have now been put on hold as a result of these government sanctions. Roman Abramovich, if he wants to continue to sell, will have to apply for a special licence from the government, which the indications are that he could get if he wants to continue with it, which we assume he will. Um, But Chelsea will be able to fulfil their fixtures. They'll still be able to, to continue to pay their staff but there will be quite a lot of restrictions on them in terms of their day-to-day business. And they certainly won't be able to operate with the sort of um, freedom, financial freedom that they're used to, certainly under Roman Abramovich's tenure. We've seen pictures of Chelsea Megastore shut for now with no knowledge of when it will reopen. We've seen opposing clubs saying, we cannot sell tickets to you for games at Stamford Bridge for tickets that haven't already gone on sale. Who will this affect most? Well, initially, it will affect the fans the most because, um, as you say, the ticket sales now are going to be restricted. So basically any ticket sales from Thursday morning cannot carry on, cannot continue, cannot be sold. So as you say, the the mega store is shut. So this applies to merchandise as well. The Chelsea Hotel at Stamford Bridge, they can't take any bookings until further notice. Um, And the fans now can't buy tickets for for games that are coming up. For example, the Middlesbrough away game in the FA Cup, the the tickets were due to go on sale for that on Thursday. That has not taken place. And significantly also, if Chelsea get through in the Champions League, um, the season tickets don't actually cover the cup matches. So there is a very real possibility that if they beat Lille um, or qualify for the quarterfinals, that they'll have to play that home leg behind closed doors. As we know, fans have already bought their tickets for the Lille away game. Um, they've already obviously played Norwich. So they're good. those are two away games that basically will be the last ones that Chelsea will be able to attend for quite some time. Some suggestions regarding the trip to Lille and how much can be spent on that to a maximum. We're not going to get to the stage where they're going to get in each other's cars and hitch a lift to get to to France for this one. What's going on with that? Well, they're they're fortunate, again, in the sense that the timing of this means that 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 trip will will, will almost certainly already, well, it will have been organised already, so it won't be affected by by the the £20,000 cap. My understanding is that that cap that um, covers any away game is a little bit flexible, so if they were to go a little bit over that, I think that the government would would be willing to let that slide. But what we'll probably see is a smaller entourage being travelling to away games. Sometimes they take 50, 60 personnel, maybe more. When you think about the backroom staff, club directors, all of those sort of analysts, all these kind of people who, who, who make up the, uh, the, the typical composition of a, for an away trip, that will have to be streamlined. I don't think we'll be seeing them, you know, in the, the sort of down market hotels as such, but they may have to look at things like that, particularly if you think about the Champions League quarterfinals, the semifinals, if they get that far once again. You're talking about cities that are further afield than Lille. Again, Lille is actually sort of accessible from London via the Eurostar, so you can get a train there. There's obviously a a short plane flight. But if they were to go somewhere else further afield in Europe, and even some of the away games up north uh, in in England, you know, quite often they would fly to those matches. They may may now be looking at getting trains or maybe taking coaches and revising their their schedule around that. So there there will be an impact there of of some description. There's also um, a £500,000 limit on staging home games, and while that shouldn't affect things too much for the typical match day going fan, it might affect the commercial experience and the corporate experience. You know, in the boxes on match day when they get the sort of lavish um, lunches and, and, and the alcohol and all that sort of thing, some of that might have to be scaled back just to make sure that it falls within that budget. Chelsea fans have done nothing wrong here, yet they're likely to be punished. Is there anything stopping Chelsea from handing out free tickets to games to their own supporters? Because they would rather have a full house of 40,000 Chelsea fans not paying than play it behind closed doors. Can they do that? It's a good point. I think it's something that they'll look to explore. Um, Theoretically, there's no reason why that they can't because the whole reason why this is happening is technically if if they're generating money from ticket sales, that money could be taken directly to the owner and therefore he could profit from it. And as an asset being frozen by the UK government, they can't generate money in that way. 
So obviously they wouldn't generate income if they had uh, free tickets, but then you sort of open up yourself to the issue of, well, do you give them free food? Do you give them free free uh, drinks? How, how do you kind of process the catering side of it? But I think, you know, it's one of many things that they're looking at at the moment. This You, I, you cannot... You cannot underestimate how much this has taken everyone by surprise. One final point, kind of on the off the field issues. A couple of weeks ago, or less than that, Roman Abramovich handing over the kind of day to day ownership of the football club to the charitable arm. The more we delved into that, we, we kind of thought, well, well, he's still the owner. This is, is now a problem for him. And you mentioned a couple of minutes ago that he can apply for special dispensation to still sell the football club. If he gets that, how do they ensure that he does not profit, because this is the whole point of this, from the sale of the football club and any monies earned from that don't go to him? Well, the asset is frozen. So if the sale is completed, those funds are frozen until such a time that they can, either he's no longer under sanction, or I think what's probably more likely is he's already stated that any any profit from the sale would be donated to the victims of Ukraine. It's not really quite clear exactly what vehicle would be used to to, to channel those funds to, to, to those people, but that's where they want to send the money. And I suspect that the government would comply with that and that in some way or another, and let's be fair, again, the government has never been involved and never been appointed to handle the sale of a Premier League club. So we're in uncharted territory on that one. But I think what's more likely than, than anything else is that that money, because the sale would be overseed by the government, that money, when the transaction was completed, would be in the government's hands and then they could distribute it how they see fit in accordance with the sanctions that they've already delivered upon Abramovich. Let's end this talking about things on the field and transfer window right now is closed, so nothing can be done anyway. But what happens to the players out of contract in the summer when the transfer window reopens? Well, they have three players, three men's players who are out of contract. There are four women's players who also have their deals expiring this summer. But just to concentrate on the men's side, there's Azpilicueta, Rudiger uh, and Andreas Christensen. All three of those have their deals expiring at the end of the season. And as it stands under these sanctions, they cannot sign those players to new contracts. Stands to reason because we don't know who the owner is going to be. We don't. They cannot simply commit that level of funds. You're talking about multi-million pound deals on new players that might run two, three, four years, however long the contract might be. So there's a there's a real problem there. Three key assets on the playing side could be lost for nothing in the summer. And my understanding is that although talks have taken place with other clubs, with all three of those players, they're all now emboldened to think that there's a chance that they could prize these, these guys away because not only can they offer uh, perhaps a, a bigger salary or a huge signing on fee, but now they can say, look, we can offer you some stability. We can offer you a clear picture of what this club is going to be like next season. Barcelona are talking to Christensen. They're also talking to Azpilicueta. Rudiger has attracted interest from a number of clubs, Manchester United, Real Madrid among them. And those clubs can also look, you do not know what you are going to sign up for if you stay at Chelsea and if you decide when you can to commit your future to Chelsea. They can now say, look, you can sign a deal with us tomorrow. They are free. They're in the final six months of their contracts. Those players who are talking to clubs from overseas can sign those pre-contract agreements now if they want to. They can have their security sorted. They can map out their future and it can all be clear. What Chelsea are going to have to ask them to do is say, look, stick with us. We think you like it here. We want you to stay stick with us through this difficult period and we'll come out the other side. And hopefully, if there's a quick, relatively quick sale of the club, the club's then no longer under any sanction and they can start nailing down their, their squad for next season. But that, at the moment, it just has to be taken on trust because nobody with a straight face can tell these players how long this situation is going to mm. last. Final question, James, has to be, is this the end of Chelsea as we know it and have known it? since Abramovich came in? Or can there be a continuation if a new owner is found? Or what's going on? This is the end of Chelsea as we know it, in terms of the the club that is structured to be bankrolled by one man. They make no secret of it. They released their financial accounts, the latest of financial accounts at the end of December, and they state quite clearly in those, we are reliant on Roman Abramovich's money. £1.5 billion is the loan at the moment. He's put in more than that in the 19 years that he's been there. 
they are not a club that runs profitably without their owner. So the idea that they can compete with Stamford Bridge only holding 40,000 with their commercial revenues not particularly matching the top clubs around Europe, the idea that they can compete for top-end wages, top-end transfer fees without another owner coming in who's prepared to be as generous a benefactor as Abramovich has been, it's very difficult to see how Chelsea can continue to compete at the very, very highest level going forward. That's quite a statement. What positives to end with can you give Chelsea fans? Well, the, po- the positives are that there are a number of bidders who've already expressed their interest in Chelsea and they've not been put off by the fact that the Stamford Bridge redevelopment is very expensive and very complicated. They've not been put off, although they don't want to meet it, but they've not been put off by Abramovich's original £3 billion asking price. We know there are multiple bidders interested and serious bidders interested, from particularly from the US, there's um, Nick Candy, and as a UK-based entrepreneur, who's looking at the, at the, at the possible bid, and, and, and there are others beyond that. It's very possible that one of these or more of these um, owners, potential owners, could come in, buy the club, and bankroll them into a, into a brighter future. There's every chance of that. I think there's also something to say for the fact they've got a top coach, they've got an elite playing staff. Let's not forget they are the current world and European champions. Even if they lost all three of those players that we're talking about, there's still a very strong squad there to work with and plenty of assets that if they had to sell to then reinvest, they could do that as well. The academy is one of the best in the world in terms of producing players. None of that disappears overnight but it's all underwritten, it's all underpinned by the generosity of the owner. And there's no guarantee that that will be replaced, whoever comes in to succeed Abramovich. Thanks so much for watching ESPN on YouTube. And for more sports highlights and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for premium content and live streaming, subscribe to ESPN+.